Okay, good evening everyone. I'm Dr. Freedom and I, tonight I'm getting a chance to sit down and have a chat with uh, Mark Strickson. Uh, a lot of you people out there know him as uh, V's Lord Turlo from back in the day on Doctor Who, you know, back with Peter Davison. Um, but it turns out that since then you've, you've sort of left acting. You've been doing a lot of different other things, uh, producing wildlife videos and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been a long life. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, I, um, are you going to use the video from this? Because I've probably put a light on. <laughs> I'll just go and turn a light on. Okay. You might now be able to see my face, but there we are. You see me a bit better anyway. That's okay. Um, I'm just using an audio recorder anyway. Okay. So. Yes. No. Um. Yes. No. Um. Since I left Doctor Who, um. Well, I. I I worked as an actor, and then um, my wife at the time, Julie um, Brennan, who was in Paradise Towers in Doctor Who, um, we decided we'd go to Australia because we couldn't stand the English weather. <laughs> it's absolutely true. <laughs> we'd had three very bad summers in a row. And um, anyway, we decided um, we'd do something completely different. And, and um, I did a zoology degree, and she did a, um, an anthropology degree. Um, and then having done a zoology degree, by that time our marriage had broken up, <laughs> I came back to the UK and um, I sat in a room and I wrote three films, The Ten Deadliest Snakes in the World, um, uh, a film on the evolution of kangaroos and a thing called The Flying Chipolatas, which was about very fatty moths that migrate across Australia. Now what I didn't know was at that time how did anybody had made natural history films about Australia? Um, so I was sitting in a very strong position. And um, the first film, The Ten Deadly Snakes of the Wor in the World, was Steve Irwin's first film. And um, basically I wrote off and emailed. Well, the first thing I should say was I, I, I sent these films out to film companies and a company called Partridge Films said, um, we quite like these films. Um, shall we buy them off you or would you like to come and work for us? So I said, well, actually, I'd like to come and work for you. And they said, well, we won't pay you very much because you've got no track record in this, in this, in you know, in, in producing television. So I said, that's all right. You've got to start somewhere. So I, I, I took the risk there, and um, it was the best thing I ever did. Um, I emailed all over the world and phoned people to try and find a presenter for the ten deadliest snakes in the world. And Terry Irwin, Steve Irwin's wife, sent in a video of Steve. And um, the rest is history, so to speak. We actually looked at this video of Steve Irwin and thought, we'll make one hour with this guy because he's going to be either a star or a nightmare. Um, and in fact, he turned out to be a star. So, and I became a, a sort of name director overnight. And um, yeah, I've been making natural history, history, science. Um, Films ever since, um, so even some cooking, some comedy. Um, you still there? Oh yeah, I'm listening. Yeah, some cooking, some comedy, um, and I'm currently making um, uh, a sort of a, a program about the countryside in Scotland. Oh, okay, so that's which, which goes out once every week. So oh. um, on on ITV um, in in the UK. So yeah, no. Um, uh, and why why did I suddenly come back? I've been in New Zealand for twelve years, um, or the Middle East working, making natural history films. <laughs> um, and um, I came back from from New Zealand because uh, my parents are both now eighty six, and um, my mum's not so good. Um, and I thought I should get a job back somewhere nearer them. It's five hours away, but that's a lot closer than New Zealand. New Zealand is a long, long way away from anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, I, I watched one of your previous convention appearances, and I was amazed, you know, just how many different flights you got to catch and how many different ways you got to try just to get back to the UK. It's yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's 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 bone crunchingly horrible. The flying from New Zealand to to it's not so bad to America, but America's only halfway to the UK. You know, America's actually relatively easy from New Zealand. Well, there's certainly the um, the the West Coast is. Uh, but no, it's 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 a long way away from 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 anywhere. And the town I lived in was called um, Dunedin, 
which is um, the old um, Scottish name for Edinburgh. And it was founded by the Scottish. It has almost exactly the same climate as where, as where I'm living now. There's thick snow on the ground in Dunedin at the moment in New Zealand. It's summer, of course, here in, in, in near Edinburgh in Scotland. But um, no, it's exactly the same. Um, so there's no culture shock at all. In Dunedin, in New Zealand, there's a big statue of Robert Burns, the famous Scottish poet in the town square. Um, I woke up every, well, certainly on Saturday mornings to the sound of bagpipes in the air, the practicing in the bagpipe hall. Um, and the, even the street map is the same as in Edinburgh. <laughs> so, it's no different at all, no culture clash at all. And people here say, oh, you know, um, how are you going to cope with the cold in the winter? Well, then I point out to them that Dunedin in New Zealand was the last place that Scott and Shackleton got supplies before they went to the Antarctic. Um, and there is nothing between it and the Antarctic. So on a day when the wind is blowing off the Antarctic, it can be rather cold at the bottom of New Zealand. <laughs> Well, all right. You've trotted the globe quite a bit, doing documentaries and whatnot. Was there yeah. any? Was there any one location you've worked on that was you know sticks out in your mind as maybe the most difficult or most memorable? Well, difficult or memorable, <laughs> different things. Well, the difficult is memorable. Um, if I was gonna, if I was gonna recommend somebody to go somewhere and they were they really loved animals and they wanted to see beautiful things, I'd say go to Sri Lanka. Um, amazing amount of birds, um, elephants, crocodiles. The jaguars. Um, I mean, it's extraordinary. There's just Sri Lanka, which is an island off the east coast of India, is just bursting with wildlife. Um, it's absolutely fantastic, and the food's fantastic, and the beer is too. Um, it's just a lovely place. The people are lovely. So that, if I was going to recommend somebody to go on a nature holiday, I guess that's what I'd say. I think the most memorable place I worked was an island called Batanta which is off the west coast of Irian Jaya. Um, where's that? Well, if you come up from Australia, you'll get to Papua New Guinea. And Irian Jaya is a, an independent state on the to, the to the west of Papua New Guinea. And to the west of Irian Jaya, there are a series of islands. And what people would know them most for is... Um, they have the birds of paradise those amazing birds with extraordinary feathers and they, they, they do these incredible mating displays um, I wasn't there to film though I was there to try and find and film an animal called a tree crocodile it's supposed to be the longest lizard in the world not the biggest um, because that would be the Komodo dragon which I have also filmed <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, they they're reputed to jump from trees onto their prey um, and they're called flying crocodiles in the local language. Now that was a eight hour journey by dugout canoe with a motor on the back um, from the nearest town. And it was incredibly remote. There are very few people there because um, basically the malaria is so bad. So the people who are there have had malaria from birth and sit around not doing a lot, it has to be said, because they don't have the energy to and um, you, uh, if you were 40 you would be a very very old man in that society um, so it is extraordinary going to these places um, I have had malaria and I can tell you it is not funny it is extremely painful at times um, people think it's just sweating it's not I had malaria for about two years before it broke out of my body and in fact I caught it in Sumatra but it, uh, my body must have been strong enough to put it off for two years. Uh, but all that time, I thought, oh, just every bone in my body aches. This, what, this is what getting old must be like. I'm just getting old. And I wasn't even that old. I was 40-something. And um, then it came. And the back pain was unbelievable. And you, your brain starts to fry. Uh, my 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 brain was 40 centigrade or something something ridiculous like that um and uh yeah no it's it's really unbelievable so you think of these poor people who have malaria um from birth uh but the interesting story about that was that on the next beach up from us there was a camp of sea pirates and they looked not like the local people at all they looked like gypsies long curly black hair and rings and things 
and um, they pretty much earned a living by going out to sea and getting yachts that were passing by um, and killing the people on them and taking all their belongings and then they came back and lived on the beach next to us <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I paid them to look for lizards <laughs> it's a good move <laughs> so you've encountered right some extraordinary experiences in there I, I have been totally blessed in terms of, I always said people say, "Why did you stop acting?" And I did stop acting. I stopped acting for two reasons. One, I was a bit bored, and and two, I wanted to do something different with my life. I have done amazing things as an actor. You pretend to do amazing things, um, and that there is a big difference between the two. Um, so I'm, I have absolutely no regrets. Even though I like acting, I love I love acting, and I like the process of acting. But I would never have had the life I've had if I if I'd been an actor or the experiences I've had or visited. I mean, I've been all over the world um, filming. It's been yeah, it's been it's been pretty incredible, really. So have you encountered animals, pirates, and just about everything else out there? It sounds like. Um, I, I, I have actually. Yes. <laughs> I can I, I I can actually talk for hours about it. <laughs> People say, why don't you write a book? And I say, well, maybe I'm one day I write a book, but I'm too busy still to write a book. I have a seven-year-old son, well, he's almost seven, Tom. And um, Tom keeps me pretty busy. Um, maybe when Tom's left home, when I'm about 70, I'll have time to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing, you know, it's like, you know, between all this, you know, one day you get a call you know, from Big Finish saying, look, we'd like you to come in and reprise this role. What what was that like? Well, I had a call from Big Finish about three weeks ago. <laughs> uh, 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 no, it's really nice. It's, 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 it's really nice. I've been doing that for, gosh, gosh, how many? I was one of the first ones to do anything for Big Finish. Um, it was really lovely for me because I've worked with lovely people on Doctor Who, Janet, Sarah and Peter and Nicola. I mean, they're all very nice people. So it's lovely to see them again. I like acting. Um, and so it gives me a chance to do a bit of acting. Uh, very luckily, because I was living in New Zealand until two months ago, um, they've always worked it around me. I've told them when I'm in the UK, and I've just done three or four days with Big Finish and done done their done the, done their products. Um, so you know, it's been it's been really nice. They're a nice team. The guys I work with on Doctor Who are lovely, so what could be bad about that? Oh, I always say that people, the question people ask me about Doctor Who is, did you enjoy working on Doctor Who? And I say yes, because it's just like any other job. If you work with nice people, you don't mind going into work. Um, I mean, nobody wants to go to work every day, let's face it. Um, but if you, at least you work with nice people and there's a nice crew around you, then then you think, well, yeah, it's not, it's not so bad, you know. Um, and then that, 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 that's the same with Big Finish. They're, they're just a nice, a nice crowd, so I don't mind doing it at all. And they have good scripts, um, so it's fun as well on that level. So, yeah, um, they've just come to me about doing something on my own. They're doing a whole series of things with people on their own. Um, I can't quite remember what it is. Oh, Companion Chronicles? Yeah, but I've done one of them, haven't I? I think oh. I've done one of them. Oh, yeah, Ring Pool World. I love that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I think... Um, this, this one's different. This one is literally on your own, not with any other actors. So, um, oh, okay. Sounds pretty interesting so far. <laughs> or perhaps, perhaps I'm the guinea pig. <laughs> I'm the one they test things out on. <laughs> okay, in between all your globe trotting, you know, of course you know that they've you know restarted the series since 2005. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, have you had a chance to take a look at any of it? Yeah, or? No, I do look at it every so often. I mean, I have to say, it's quite hard for me, and and there's a particular reason for that. It's not that I don't like. I mean, I do like Doctor Who. I think it's a it's 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 a great series, um, but I hardly watch television. And the reason for that is because my job requires me to watch television all day, and it requires me to either look at a computer or a television screen in an edit room most of the day. And my eyes get so tired by the end of the day, I can't cope with the thought of watching another bright screen. And I guess you just have to sort of um, be in my job to understand what that what that's like. We we're supposed to once an hour walk away from the screens and look into the distance because it damages your eyes. You're know, just focusing at one one level. But I do. I get my eyes get very very tired by the end of the day. So I tend to listen to the radio. Um, 
I, I actually don't even read very much anymore um, um, because because my eyes are so tired. Um, but that's you're looking for detail often, you know, when you're in an edit room. You're looking for tiny things that are wrong. Um, so you do the big things first, then you do all the tiny things. And that is quite a strain on your eyes. Um, if if people sort of were forced to watch television from nine in the morning until six at night, I don't think many people would turn on their television when they got home. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not forced to do it. I enjoy my job, but it but it that it there's still a physical strain in that. You know, you 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 want the muscles rested outside work that you use all day at work. In that case, in that case it's my eyes that get tired. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, you were on Doctor Who way back when, you know, thousands of years ago. Now it seems. Uh, hey, <laughs> I was, I was way back when. Okay, um, was there any you know, like pranks or hijinks on the set you remember? You know, where you pull a little trick on somebody or anything like that? Or well, um, y y y the, the, the problem was we didn't have any money to make anything. Uh, we were doing it on a very cheap budget, so you couldn't you couldn't do much. I have to say because um nothing could get in the way of filming it was pretty much one take when I was in it unless something went wrong so it was doing it was like acting live um, and that's when people used to come in the, into the studio they couldn't believe how fast we were working but you got used to that um, that, 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 that was alright and then he did learn to do certain little things one of my tricks used to be I used to fiddle with stuff because all the sound is laid on afterwards. So when the, the classic example is when the TARDIS screen goes up and when you're watching Doctor Who from my era, there's an electrical sound. It goes as it goes up. But in fact, the sound in the studio was of a bicycle chain going round because behind the screen there was a man winding a bicycle chain um, to get the screen up. It was all worked manually. So it's, when the screen went up in the studio, it went <coughs> uh, and, but Of course, that was all taken off and put, electrical sounds were put on. And similarly, none of the buttons on the TARDIS console made a noise. That was all added on afterwards. So what you could do, you know, um, if you're feeling particularly mischievous, was um, you could press buttons on the TARDIS console in the background. And, and position yourself so you could do that and this would drive the sound engineers mad because they had to lay on all that sound afterwards and I now realise what a pain up the arse that must have been <laughs> <laughs> but you know we just, we just used to do it out of mischievousness when, when somebody else you know had a, had a long speech you'd start playing with buttons in the background so under their long speech you got <laughs> and that was that was just us being mischievous really I mean acting's like any other job there's an element of boredom in acting um, it, it, it can get repetitive um, it's you know there's a lot of hanging around those sorts of things so you do yeah you do get up to little bits of mischief but not big bits of mischief because big bits of mischief mean time and time means money in television so, um, yeah, if you want to be an actor, I've got a few words of advice for you. Be nice to everybody you ever meet. Um, arrive on time, know your lines, and don't complain about anything. <laughs> that's, that's my advice for you, if you want to be an actor. Okay, a friend of mine you know, said, look, you've got to ask him about the infamous hair dyeing. <laughs> oh, infamous yeah, hair dyeing. Yes, well, yes, that, was, that was purely because I... Um, I think it must be summer, and my, my hair goes really blonde in the summer. It just does that in the sun. And um, I used to swim a lot as well. Chlorine bleaches your hair. Um, I used to swim a lot until I came to Scotland about two months ago. Um, and just it's uh, not possible in my current way of life. Um, but uh, yeah, so they, uh, anyway, they said, um, you know, Teller comes from a, another planet, we need him to to look a bit alien so they suggested I had all my hair cut off and I thought that was a really really bad idea um, I just I, just, I still think it would have been a really really bad idea um, I don't quite get that one um, but the problem was that at the time Peter Davison and I had very similar haircuts and in long shot you could have confused me for him um, 
and so it was totally right. You, you need regular characters in a series to be instantly identifiable, which is why I always wore a black suit. And um, so then they so yes, it was it was John Nathan Turner who came to me, the producer, and said, uh, "We've got this idea, Mark. You know, how about having all your hair cut off?" And I said, "Absolutely not, John. It's not going to happen." And so then they came to me and said, "Rather well, cut your hair really short and we'll dye it bright red with a washout dye." because it was a really weird metallic colour. And so I said, oh, that's fine, that's absolutely fine. But of course it wasn't washout at all. Um, so I was about one of the most recognisable people in the UK for about two and a half years. And children would shout at me in parks and things. And it also just used to come out on my pillow every night. I thought I must have bought a new pillowcase every two weeks. They were all dyed red with the hair dye that was, that was coming out of me. But um, no, it was, the, the only the downside of it was that I became instantly recognisable to kids in the street, um, and that that was a a, a bit of an issue. Um, I couldn't, you can't, you can't, just, you can't, even if you put dark glasses on, you can't hide bright red hair. I suppose you just put a hat on, don't you? You know, and, um, <laughs> I've never looked good in. So. <laughs> How vain <laughs> <great> is that? <laughs> Okay, well, also, you know, being on Doctor Who, you get to work with you know, some, you know, pretty interesting people who came on and off the show. Um, what was it like working with Valentine Dial as, you know, the Black Guardian? You know, those little exchanges you had with him, you know, they were always pretty interesting to me. Yeah, no, Valentine was great to work with. Um, uh, he was a very nice chap. Um, the only difficulty with Valentine was he was quite old. Even older than I am. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and so he used to get he used to get a cheap fare in a pensioner's fare in from he lived in near Brighton on the south coast of England. So Valentine never arrived for rehearsals until eleven o'clock in the morning and had to leave at about three to get the last train back on the cheap fare back. <laughs> so he was hardly available for rehearsal really, Valentine. <laughs> and um, and when he um, his, he had that deep bass voice. And I'm sure one of the reasons he had that deep ba bass voice was because he used to smoke a pipe incessantly. Oh. Uh, a quick detour here into my life in Doctor Who was that Rula Lenska, um, the actress, was in Doctor Who with me, married to Dennis Waterman. I remember it because we were doing a Doctor Who story and Boy George was singing Karma Karma Chameleon in Top of the Pops. And um, Rula Lenska and I went and danced at the back of the Top of the Pops studio, which is the BBC's flagship pop, used to be the BBC's flagship pop music show. But anyway, Rula, we will get back on track soon. Um, <laughs> Rula always used to smoke a cheap cigar before she did a voiceover to roughen her vocal cords up. So she had that wonderful sort of deep, sexy voice. Well, Valentine didn't need to, because he just smoked a pipe continuously. Um, and I had a dressing room on the ground floor, one of the star dressing rooms in the BBC. Valentine was consigned to the floor below me. Valentine came up to the, uh, to, to, to the studio, um, remonstrating vehemently that his, his, um, his basement dressing room was airless. And so, being a nice young actor, I said, "Oh look, um, Valentine," and he must have been eighty odd at the time. Um, I said, "Valentine, you can have my dressing room. It's absolutely fine. I'll have yours." At the next break, I'll come down, and you know, the dresser will bring my clothes down, and your dresser will bring your your clothes up into my dressing room. And this was all fine. Went down, and how anybody can complain that their dressing room is airless when they're the, the, the window is shut. There was actually a window outside, a high window. The window was shut, and you couldn't see across the room for pipe smoke. So, um, yes, that, so that's the secret of Valentine Dial's gravelly voice. Smoke pipe continuously. <laughs> but he was a lovely chap. I mean, I, I have to say, I've, most actors are very nice. Um, it's one of the things I miss, is that actors are, most actors are very easy to get on with. Um, maybe it's because we meet different people all the time and we have to forge working relationships all the time with different people because you never get the same people you know, in, in the next job and actors like this continuously moving 
And so you get used to making friends and, and getting on with sometimes people who aren't that, you know, who you don't like that much, but you, you know, you, you have to make do as an actor. Um, because it it just makes life unpleasant if you don't. So I think actors are in general very tolerant, nice people. Um, I can't think of any horrible actors I've met. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Here's a weird question. Let's just say out of nowhere you get a call from Lo Rothlock, and they say, "Look, we want you to come down and reprise the role of Turlo. Would you do it for the t new TV show?" Yeah, yeah, of course I would. Well, no, I have to say, depending on my contract, I, mean, my, I couldn't get out of my contract with ITV at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd have to, first of all, I'd have to ask my employer, um, <laughs> ITV, to explain to people who aren't from England, is the other big broadcaster. And, well, there's the BBC, there's ITV historically, mm. and then there's Channel 4 and Channel 5. And I work for the other big broadcaster in the UK. Um, ITV, and I have an exclusive contract to ITV. So the first thing I'd have to do is ask ITV to give me some time off. Um, and, and yeah, but then I'd love to do it. Yeah, yeah, be absolutely fine. Okay, and they, if they gave you a chance, you know, to actually, you know, say, look, you know, we'd like you to write this particular character. Where would you put Turlo at being at right now? You know, where, where what would you see him doing? Well, this is the thing. Traveling through time is wonderful. So um, I could. If Turner went back to his planet, right, and he was going to go back into politics. If people remember the Minutai of Doctor Who's stories, um, because he'd been thrown out of his country because he was a political exile. So I, if I could play Turner now, I'd probably want a sort of graying beard and be a ranting politician. <laughs> <laughs> on this planet somewhere trying to um, but perhaps we could be at war with another planet that, that, that would, that's it's, it's sort of like sort of like a Star Wars thing right? you know and um, then the, 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 the doctor could could remind me I, I could have gone really bad you see as to I, I could be this ranting um, hating person who was causing this war, and the doctor would have to remind me that once, once upon a time I was an innocent young man. Did I learn nothing from him? There you are. <laughs> okay, I want to thank you, Mark. Uh, that's all the questions I had for you. And I, you know, it's been incredible getting a chance to sit down, and have a talk with you, learn, you know, listen to your experiences, and you know, you've done some really great things outside of acting, and you know. It's been, you know, especially with Steve Irwin, who was taken away from us way too early. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. That was that was that was very sad. But no, I, I mean, I, I feel I've had a, a, a blessed life. Um, it, it hasn't been easy sometimes. It's been very hard. But, um, but yeah, I have a, I'll, I'll have a few stories to tell my grandchildren should I ever have any. <laughs> okay, thank you again, Mark. It's been fantastic talking to you. Dr. Freedom, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you too. Okay, take care. Okay, signing <laughs> off. All right, bye-bye.